So this is going to be a change of pace, a large change of pace. So I'm going to talk about out of distribution generalization. So where I'm going to start with this problem is one where uh, the goal is to classify cows versus penguins. And if you're doing machine learning, you, the way you might go about doing this is you'll go out, you'll go take a bunch of photos of penguins, go take a bunch of photos of cows, uh, be like, I have the labels for them, then you'll train whatever machine learning model you have. And then you'll check its performance on some images that you never saw in training and be like, if the performance is good, great, I have like a model that works. And uh, you might do that and on this data set you're like, hey, I get 90% accuracy. Uh, for humor, let's just say that cows and penguins are equal. They're like 50-50. And you're like, great, uh, I've done a good job. I should go and use this for something. Then you move along and then I'm going to give you this image right here. It's a penguin on grass. You pass this to your algorithm and then what you get out is cow. <laughs> and then it really makes you question like, uh, what did your machine learning actually learn? Anybody have a thought on like uh, how you might make a prediction that's accurate but somehow you get cow here? I see some people smiling in the way in the back. Grass, wonderful, yeah. So you go out and collect images in the real world, you're like, well, penguins, mostly on snow or ice, cows more often on grass or fields, and so you can do a pretty good job just looking at that. You're like, yeah, maybe that's boring, I can go collect a data set and make it nicer. But uh, it's actually a real world problem in healthcare as well too. So in this example, we have, uh, a visualization of the representation inside of a convolutional neural net. On the left is a randomly initialized one, on the right is a pre-trained one, it means it's trained for some other task and we're just looking at it. And this is before we see the data where the goal is to take in some hip x-rays and detect whether there's a fracture or not. If we look and we just look at a visualization of these representations projected down to two dimensions, we can see that they cluster and there are different colors here. The color is a little bit hard to see. But uh, if we cluster them, we can see that uh, the scanner model is pretty determined by the cluster. So this X5000 scanner is down here. Also, the view in which the chest X-ray, or sorry, the hip X-ray was taken is also clusterable. You can detect it here. But uh, it's quite hard to see here. But before you've done any training, you can see something that fracture is also clustered. Most of the fractures are down here. It should be brown versus gray. Uh, but then if you look up, you're like, hey, most of the fractures are on a single scanner. And so you could go through the same process. You could take your data, take your labels for fracture or not, have the nice held out set that you never saw in training, get good performance. And in the end, what you're looking at is uh, what scanner the x-ray was collected on. Another example of this is uh, Relatively recent is when people were trying to detect COVID-19 in chest x-rays. People around the world were releasing positive examples of chest x-rays with people that had COVID just because they wanted to share it and make sure that other people knew what was going on early in the pandemic. Uh, and some other people are like, we can take these positive examples, take existing chest x-rays that we have from before uh, 2019 and then try to classify is there COVID or not or detect is there COVID or not. And so people did that, their accuracy was incredibly high. You know, like, they're like, we can do this uh, very, very high. The AURC, because it's not balanced, is also incredibly high. Then somebody came along and was like, okay, let's try to visualize what's important. It's a little bit tricky sometimes to see what's going on when you have nonlinear classifiers, but like over here is an example of what's important. And uh, that's outside of the body. It's like right above your shoulders. And you'll be like, oh, you know, you have a little bit of knowledge, you'll be like, uh, that should not be useful in telling if you have COVID or not, it's outside of your body. Uh, and, so, and so what's going on is actually that the x-rays that were released for people with COVID, their shoulders were dropped down as low as possible in the film, while for the other x-rays that they had, the shoulders were pushed up as high as possible, so they, aligned, they were aligned to the top. And with that, you get incredible performance, but without looking at it, boy, you could be in trouble. And this is kind of a common issue in healthcare because, you know, people have some health state, you know, uh, they can be sick. Uh, and if you're more sick, that will affect the kind of data that's collected about you and how it's collected about you. The canonical example I give is if you're really, really sick uh, and you can't move, 
the type of x-ray that you'll get is a portable x-ray. You're not going to go to an x-ray machine and get that. And that is going to be informed by your health state. And then whatever you're trying to detect or predict is also a function of your health state. So you'll expect to see these correlations in your data. And it appears outside of healthcare. We talked about this cows versus penguins, we talked about x-rays. Another example is in natural language inference where you can try to figure out whether two sentences are entailed. And you know, one thing that you might look at is just how similar the words are in the two sentences. Words that are more similar are likely to be related. Sorry, sentences with similar words are more likely to be related. But I will say that without more knowledge, this problem is hard. What do I mean by that is like, if I went back to the earlier example about the COVID chest x-rays, I would find that, well, the computer has no idea that the part that's out of your body is not informative for the prediction. It's like extra knowledge you have of the problem that you're bringing in. And when we ask for extra knowledge, one kind of knowledge we can ask for is about these nuisances. So things that are predictive, but not necessarily stable in how they're predictive. So word overlap is an example. In the example of cows versus penguins, the backgrounds, so like the environment you're in is another example. Another one for diabetes is BMI. If you're looking at uh, one population and you look at the correlation between BMI and diabetes, move to say uh, an Asian population, you'll see a, you'll see a different relationship. And we can try to formalize this with a bit of math. So here we have uh, this big circle is a collection of distributions, so places where you can get data from. Uh, for these distributions, there's an x and a y and a z. An x is like the, in, the input with the chest x-ray you saw. Y is like a label, uh, is there COVID or not? And z is extra information. Could be like the boundary, so you know what the background versus the foreground is. It could be also like uh, what scanner the device was on. And your goal really here is to build a model that works for any distribution in this set where what's changing between distributions is the relationship between the label and the nuisance. So in the, like the cows versus penguins example, what could change if I say collected a data set in, I don't know, only an icy climate is how often cows are appearing on ice. So if I tell you that the nuisance label relationship is a problem, like there's some rela relationship between how cows appear on grass and penguins appear on snow, your first thought would be like, why don't we break this relationship? Like if we can do estimation of a distribution where there is no dependence between the background and the label, hey, that should be good. You can build like a good model out of it. And so I'm not gonna say how you construct it, I'm just writing this down. So Y and Z here are independent, just because they factorize. And then the model, when I talk about what you'd use, is just the conditional distribution of whatever the output is, given the input, in this special distribution where these two variables are not dependent. The label and the nuisance are independent. It's a good idea, but it doesn't work by itself for uh, a textbook reason. And so the graph on the left is one where y and z are independent. x depends on y and z. And if you like opened like your textbook, like the Bishop book, and you saw like a graphical model, you'd say, if you condition on a child, the parents can become dependent. And so what does that mean for this very specific problem here? Well, if I have this family, everything is normal. You can calculate things nicely. If I say that Y and Z are independent, that means in this family, the index A is zero. So Y doesn't appear inside of Z. And you see that x is just two coordinates. One is y minus z in some noise. The other is y plus z in some noise. If you just ask yourself, what is the best predictor when y and z are independent, you're going to weight this second coordinate a little bit more because there's less noise in it. OK, if you weight it a little bit more, though, somehow z is going to appear inside of it. Then uh, when I change a, go to different members in this family, I'm going to start accumulating error. And you can accumulate enough error that you're worse than chance. Chance here is just saying, I forget about everything. I'm just going to predict what the marginal distribution says. But there is a good predictor here. If I take x1 plus x2, the z's cancel, and I get something that's like 2y plus noise. 
and this noise is completely exogenous, and I could use that to build a good predictor. And so we'll work with that idea. So the idea is that rather than trying to build models just based on uh, an x uh, in this distribution where we've break in the, broken the correlations, we're going to try to work with representations of x. So representations are just functions of the input. They'll be learned eventually. But we want to limit ourselves to representations that when conditioned on, the label and the nuisance don't become dependent. And to make things a little bit more formal, we want to know if we've done a good job. And so we'll have some notion of performance. So performance under a distribution PD, which is in this family, just a fixed member of this family, of a model, which is Q of Y given X, is the negative expected KL divergence or the expected, help, the expected log probability. All you really need to know is that bigger is better. More performance is good. And if we set up this distribution and fix representations in this family, you already get something. And the something that you get is that the performance of a model is better than just the performance of just you know, guessing by chance. Because the, the second term in this is non-negative. So you have a KL divergence, it's non-negative, its average is non-negative. So at least we're getting something. So we're saying that if we build models in this family, we're going to be better than chance. And we didn't have that before. Okay. Better than chance is kind of like a, it's a good bar. We, didn't, we really didn't have that. Um, but really the answer is what you want after is like what's best. So now that I found a family of distributions where I can characterize the performance, I also tell you that it's better than chance. You'd like to know when is a representation R2 better than a representation R1. OK, I'm just going to pull this out of nowhere. We're going to call this uh, the definition of blocking. So we say that a representation R2 blocks R1. When you have knowledge of R2 and Z, R1 and Y are independent. And we can put this into the predictor and see what happens if we observe the representation R1 and R2. We get something that is proportional to the marginal, some function that doesn't contain Y, and a function that contains Y, R2 for some fixed value of Z. You're like, yes, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Can you go back one slide? Sure. So we, we're, we're mixed audio. Yeah, yeah. So here what you're really doing is like, when I told you to break the correlation and build a model, you would end up with something that was worse than chance. So that's what we learned on this previous slide here. And so we're going to go one step further and limit ourselves to certain functions where we know that we're going to be better than chance. That's what's happening here. Go ahead. Yeah, so you can see it just structurally here. So there's less noise in the second coordinate than the first one. Uh, if I try to write down what the conditional distribution is, it's going to weight this coordinate more. When you weight this coordinate more, if I look at a weighted average of this one where this coordinate's more, there's going to be some function of z that's going to appear. When I have some function of z, now I'm going to change the value of a and pick a distribution where a is gigantic then the relationship would no longer hold. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And so now we limited ourselves to these representations where you can guarantee that the performance is better than chance. Once you have that the performance is better than chance, you'd like to find one that is best in some sense. So how, how yeah, like, good. In the previous slide, you're not, you're not, you're just saying that that's what you're doing. You're, you're not telling Oh, yeah, yeah. We haven't built an algorithm yet. Like, so, like, what, where we're going to go with this is we're going to say, okay, what is better than chance? And once I tell you what's better than chance, we'll characterize it with an algorithm. Uh, but at this point, we don't have an algorithm. We're just trying to figure out what to target if we could theoretically target it. And so these are all distributions that are exact. You know, there's no estimation at this point. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, so what's interesting here is that when you look at the predictor and you have that R2 blocks R1, if we take the distribution that's on the right, 
and we normalize it so it becomes proper over y, this middle term will come out. So like the function r1 doesn't appear in the predictions. Just putting that in words, just knowing r1 doesn't change anything about the predictions. So in this sense, if r2 blocks r1, r2 could be better than r1. And uh, that's what we're going to formalize here. It's a lot of math here, but this is what will lead to the algorithm that we're after. First is that if you pick a representation that is maximally blocking, so it black blocks every other representation in the family, its performance is best. But this is sort of a characterization. It doesn't tell you any way how to find it. To find it, you can show that this representation is in the collection of representations that have highest information. Even that doesn't tell you how to exactly find it, because there could be another representation that has the same information but worse performance. And this last one basically says anyone that has equal, equal information will have equal performance. And at the end, you get that the best uncorrelating representations just have highest information with the label in this distribution where you've broken the nuisance label relationship. And what you get for like all that like, uh, work is a, a relatively simple algorithm. One is you construct an estimate of this distribution where the nuisance label relationship is broken. One way to do it is with reweighting. So if I have a generic distribution, if I divide by y given z, and then multiply by p of y, I'll get one where the y and z are independent. I can also use a generative model for this. I'll have some comments on this in a second. Um, and the second step is actually, once I have an estimate of the distribution, build the predictive model, but build it so that the representation is penalized to be in this uncorrelating set. Here, I'm penalizing the joint information. So this is the information of y, the representation, that it has jointly with z. The reason I do it is to get rid of some local optima. I have a plot for that you'll see in a little bit. But uh, in practice, even estimating the information will take a little bit of effort. Like if I tell you here are some random variables, what's their information or conditional information, you're going to maybe write a lower bound. Uh, you could use likelihood ratios and train a classifier to do it. Uh, that's what we did here. And for simple results, uh, here we have the same family that we described above, except the label, instead of being normal, is uh, discrete. And if you just trained directly on a training set where there is a positive correlation and you evaluate between the label and the nuisance, and you evaluate on the test set, you'll see that your performance has degraded quite a bit. And it makes sense, because if z is very related to y and you can see parts of z and x, you should use it. You can do a generative model to estimate the p independent, which I'll call the nuisance randomized distribution. Its performance is more stable. And the same thing for the reweighting version. You might ask, how good is it to what's best here? The best linear predictor on this problem is about 62%. So you're getting somewhere. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so this is just like your standard held out data set. So you take samples from your training distribution, you hold some out, and you evaluate what the performance is. This is uh, the performance on an estimated uh, P independent, so the nuisance randomized distributions where the nuisance and label are unrelated, marginally. And then test here is one where the correlation is flipped between training and test. It has the reverse correlation. But you. Yeah, yeah, that's exact, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. We'll see an image example a little bit in a second. This is uh, the canonical image example where you're trying to classify water birds versus land birds. Water birds appear on water more. Um, land birds appear on land more. Uh, and so your training data set is one where you know the natural one you'd collect would be heavily correlated to the water birds are on water backgrounds. And if you just train a model and use held out evaluation, you'll be like, I can do this quite well. You'll be like, I'm 91% accurate. But then if you construct a p-test where you see that, hey, some of these uh, water birds are over shore, or some of these land birds are flying over lakes, you're like, your performance has gone down quite a bit. So you're like, it's like heavy use of the background in this data set. Uh, 
Uh, here we did reweighting NERD, and we see that the performance is more stable, even if you switch the relationship completely. So 90% of images on water birds are on water, 90% of land birds are on land. You flip that relationship, the performance is still good. Uh, what we use as the nuisance here is kind of interesting. We use the outer boundary of the image. So you can have like high dimensional nuisances. The outer boundary gives you some idea of what the background is, but doesn't obscure a lot of what the animal is. You could say, hey, if you cut out the outer boundary, maybe your model would be really good. But if you train on just the center patch, you basically see the same thing as training on the entire image. You can do this on chest x-rays as well for pneumonia classification, where the natural rate of pneumonia in one hospital is much higher than another. And if you were to, again, just hold out a training set, hold out from your training set, train a model and evaluate your performance, you'll be like, you can detect pneumonia really well. If you then pick on those examples that are reversed, so take the images from the hospital with a lower frequency of pneumonia and uh, images from the hospital with a lower frequency of normal, you see that your performance is quite bad. Again, questioning like, is it that you know something about pneumonia or do you know something about the hospitals? You can get better with both generative or reweighting NERD. You know, you're at least better than chance, so chance would be 50-50. It's still not great for uh, actually any use in the clinic. Partly your base performance is quite poor as well too. The challenge with building generative models, uh, and maybe people know this, is that if you train a generative model and you simulate images from that generative model and then train a classifier on top of those simulated images, if you ask to classify real images with that trained model, it won't really do a good job. They're like artifacts in the generation that will drive the classification that don't exist in the real image. Uh, so there's a lot of related work here. I'm going to get into it more towards sort of the high level overview in the latter part. But uh, in short, what I presented is the only method that can take high dimensional nuisances and also doesn't require them at test time. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, in the large sample, large compute limit, probably that reduction is not necessary at all. And that's because if a human can do it, just looking at that image, it'll give you some lower bound on what like the uh, optimal performance is. Um, but given the data you have, I don't know how to answer that question yet. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah, so do you have to know that uh, there are different hospitals that have different, do you have to know that in advance? Yeah, so here is like a, it just it uses weaker information. You just use the fact that whatever is going on inside the body is important. Because a lot of what's about the different hospitals are encoded in the background, like the shading of blacks. Also, you can see there's like some small text all the way up there. Um, but if you had the extra information during training, that would be helpful. At test, you don't require that. Yeah, but did you have to choose like uh, the correct angle yourself? The algorithm does not do that, but we'll see, we'll see uh, like maybe how to make that a little bit easier, but the algorithm does not do that for you. Uh, so what did I mean by local optima? Uh, so in the algorithm, I, instead of penalizing the joint information, instead of penalizing the conditional information that's here, I penalize the joint information. And here I plot the objective for when we have linear representations and we have data that looks like the data I described earlier. So y is normal, z has a relationship with y, x1 is y minus z, x2 is y plus z. And if we just plot the objective, we can see that there are two kinds of optima. There's the blue optima, you can't really tell the colors here so much, but blue is better than red. But we can see that if you end up in the red spot to go to the blue line, you'll have to go through 
something that is quite uh, less performant. And this is also less performant, but it's harder to see here. Uh, but anytime I tell you I make a restriction and I don't justify it uh, some way with math, you have to ask, did you lose anything? So if you take two distri distributions in this nuisance varying family and you apply conditional nerd to it, you get the same model out. So in this sense, uh, conditional independence will give us model invariance. So no matter where you collect the data, no matter what the relationship is, you'll get the same model out in the end. If you enforce joint independence, which is stronger than conditional independence, you'll get risk invariance. You'll get both that the model is the same, but the sampling distribution of the label and the representation is the same, meaning that your performance estimate will be the same. But you can still ask, did we lose anything? Because we said one is stronger than the other. And the answer is yes, you do lose something. That's what this is basically telling you. You can say that the performance for joint independence is always less than or equal to the performance for conditional independence, and the equality can be, inequality can be strict on certain examples. And the intuition really is that the uncorrelating set is larger, and you can construct a family where the optimal representation is a sufficient statistic, and the minimal sufficient statistic is in the conditional set but not the joint set, and the minimal sufficient statistic is always a function of any other sufficient statistic, so you know that the independence can't hold. So the nuisance is an extra variable, as was pointed out in the beginning. Instead of trying to figure out what the nuisance is, you can use some basic knowledge about where the label might be to try to figure it out. So here's one example. This is another canonical example you'd find in the machine learning literature of colored MNIST. Here, the digits are the things you're actually trying to detect, 1 versus 0. The ones have green colors more often, the zeros have a red color more often. And so what we're doing here is basically using the fact that we know that the image, uh, that, I, that what I'm trying to classify by is the shape. And so if I permute pixels in it, I will destroy what I'm trying to classify by. If that still is predictive of the label, I probably should get rid of it. And so the idea is just using the label destroyed image, where label is like the actual semantic label, uh, a data augmentation as the nuisance. You can do this in the water birds versus land birds, and you'll see improved performance. Uh, one thing I'll tell you is if you're reading the literature on this and you see the data set water, bird versus, water birds versus land birds, or you see like the celebrity face data set, the cuts of the data they use might be different, and so you'll see performance changes across them, so you have to pay attention to that. You can also use the same idea in natural language inference, where here the goal is to take the premise, which is the lawyer was advised by the actor, take the hypothesis, the actor advised the lawyer, and see if the premise will tell you whether the hypothesis is true or not. So in this case, because the lawyer adv was advised by the actor, the hypothesis is not true, the actor advised the lawyer. In the second case, uh, here the doctor visited, oops, sorry, oh, that one is correct. <laughs> the second one is incorrect where the doctor visited the lawyer, but uh, the hypothesis the lawyer visited the doctor is not true because the relationship is swapped. And if you were to look at like a traditional natural language inference data set, you would find that heuristics like how much lexical overlap with would be quite accurate. You can get like 90% performance by just looking how similar the words are. And so you can use the same idea. You can try to take your words, permute their order. If that's still predictive of what's going on, you can try to pull it out. Rather than using NERD, we use the different algorithm here called Just Train Twice. Just Train Twice is a uh, cool, but it's a funny algorithm. Basically, it's like, uh, hey, train once. When you train the first time, you're probably going to find stuff that you don't want to find. So you should just train a second time, downweight those examples you did good on, because you probably used information you shouldn't use. But you know, it could go wrong if you actually do a good job. And so we're like, hey, take that like weighting and just try to weight it with uh, this nuisance-based prediction. And you, get, you do better than just the vanilla version, both in average performance and worst group performance where groups here are 
pairs of the label and the presence of a negation word. And uh, both are still better than if you were just training this directly with like a large scale language model. So I'm going to go back to a higher level at this point so we can just see the overview. So the generic setup for out of distribution generalization is you have a bunch of training distributions and you have a bunch of test distributions. So these circles are collections of distributions. In the training distribution, you observe x and y, which are your standard inputs and outputs. You also can observe some auxiliary information that may be different at test time. And the goal really is, given data from these training distributions, build a model that generalizes to everything in the test. But first off, without any assumptions, this problem is not solvable. Um, if I tell you p train of y given x is normally distributed with mean 100 times x, but the test is normally distributed with minus 100 times x, and you're like, will p train of y given x perform well? No. You're like, maybe you just picked a bad one. But you can play a game here, right? Like for any predictor you build from p-train, you can even ignore the data and have a predictor that's there. I can try to construct a p-test that will just make it bad. You don't know if it's there or not. And so you need assumptions on how testing is related to training. And the canonical assumption that uh, people make is that testing is equal to train, meaning that uh, P train and P test are the same distribution. This is called the uh, IID assumption. So the X's and Y's are drawn independently and identically from the same distribution. We get a lot for free from this. For something like held out error, so if I hold out some of my training set, evaluate the error of my model, it will tell me something about my test error because the only difference between that sample and my test sample uh, is just sampling noise. If I had a really large one, that sampling noise would go down and I could compute the average performance. But kind of what you need to keep in mind is that this is still an assumption. Like this, like I, testing equals train, you know, who gives that to you? It's not like you get to observe the full testing environment and you're like, hey, I've checked that the distributions are the same. You still assumed it. And in the examples that we went through, like penguins versus cows, the test distribution may not be the same. I can go to a different lo location where the relationship between the animals and their backgrounds can shift. For BMI, I can move to a different population where the relationship between BMI and diabetes status is changing. And in chest x-rays, when I go from one hospital to the other, the procedures by which they collect that chest x-ray vary from hospital to hospital. And so whatever is uh, informative about the label from that uh, really cannot be carried over. And so the goal of this entire like, exercise for out of distribution generalization is to broaden the set of assumptions or couplings. So we started with one, that training is equal to test. And so we now we want to go a little bit broader. One coupling you'll find in the literature is the invariant coupling. So here you observe data from a lot of training environments. Just imagine these are hospitals. You observe data from like, you know, let's just say thousands of them. And then you just assume that there exists a model where the risk is the same, okay? And the risk is the same for all distributions, training and test. And once you make this assumption, you have like a signature by which to detect if you've done a good job. You take all of your training environments you're like, if I'm getting the same performance, then I should have some belief that I'll get the same performance on test. And this is sort of the invariant assumption. Another one is a subgroup coupling, where there are different groups in your data, which are the vertices of this simplex. You get to observe data from a distribution that's uh, you know, a mixture of all these groups. You also have some auxiliary information Z, which tells you what group you're belonging to. And your test distribution is just a different mixture. It could be anywhere in this blue volume. And you want to have good performance. One way to do this would be to say, use the worst test performance on the observed groups. If I know what the worst performance is here, 
on these points, then if I look at a mixture of them, the performance on the mixture will be lower bounded by this worst that I can estimate in the training data. Okay. And another one is the common factor coupling, which is uh, what we saw earlier, where we assume that between tests and training, there's some things that are stable and some things that can change. So what changes in distributions here are the nuisance label relationship. You can also have more than one environment here. You don't need to have data just from one relationship. Um, but the common factors in the joint distribution are really what let you do estimation. In some sense, this is probably the most generic. Uh, the way to think about that is like, if I want an invariant predictor, something has to remain the same. Meaning that like, if everything in my sampling distribution can change, then if I compute something on one and then I compute it on the other, I can't get the same value out. And so something is fixed, it's just not explicit. And you can write down a lot of couplings. Here, these purple arrows are just things that I'm calling stable. The black arrows can change across different environments. Uh, but different couplings imply different good answers. So if you see in the literature, somebody is like, hey, I have a new paper on out of distribution generalization, you should be like, oh, did you define a new relationship? The choice of the relationship is a bit domain dependent, like which of these pictures holds true. This one maybe has some plausibility for the, the image and text examples, but the other ones could hold true. And the couplings need not be on coordinates of the inputs, so don't think of x1, x2, and x3 as just like dimensions of the input. They can be functions of them. This is just a different view with environment variables. You'll see these kinds of pictures as well too, where the environment is pointing to parts of the distribution that can change. So it matches up with the black arrows. The idea behind like having different environments is that if you collect enough data from all these environments and I estimate all properties of the joint distribution, I might be able to read off what is the same. If you can read off what is the same, you have a chance of building a model that will work. I use the word good several times here. You should also like pick on me just a little bit for using that word. So when training is equal to test, there is a good notion, there is like a notion of good that's well defined, meaning that I can estimate the risk. Like what is the expected loss on a held out sample of data from the same distribution? When you have many, many distributions, for a fixed model, you have many, many different risks. For distribution one, risk is, could be 10. Distribution two, risk could be 20. Distribution three, risk could be 0.1. And you have just a lot of them. So the notion of best, it's like saying like, I have a vector and being like, is this vector bigger than another vector? Do we know how to answer that question? Not really, and so you have to be reductive. And so one way to be reductive is to take the maximum risk. Another way to be reductive is to take a calibrated maximum risk where you're like, wait, if I take the maximum risk, maybe I'll focus on something that's just really hard. And so you could try to compensate for the hardness by subtracting off constants that are distribution dependent. Another one is the average risk. But boy, it's starting to get annoying, right? Like I'm telling you first, you have to like have these couplings and you have to be like, hey, this is the right one for my problem. That'll lead to an algorithm. But the algorithm requires some notion of good and the notion of good can be specific to the problem as well too. So how do you pick this notion of good? Again, like compressing a vector to a single number throws away stuff. Uh, and the choice depends on the problem or domain. Like if I want to have like, say, uh, good performance across all my groups, this one might make sense. Uh, but simultaneous optimality might be possible and might simplify it. Simultaneous optimality really means that you have the same performance across all the distributions. We saw examples of this already. One is risk invariant. So if the risk is the same for every distribution, if I just do well on one of them, I'm gonna do well on all of them. Another one we saw was NERD, where we said that the performance of R star is better than the performance of R for all of the distributions. 
getting this kind of simultaneous optimality requires restrictions, but the restrictions may be worth it because you don't have to fight the notion of what good is. Because if you're optimal for everything, then whether you pick max or calibrated max, you'll be fine. Another question you could ask is, why does causality appear? So if you pick up like this stack of papers on this subject, you'll be like, hey, they're talking about causality. Why? I didn't really mention it all until this point. So on the left, we have a causal graph where you have a confounder Z treatment X outcome Y. On the right, we have the same graph where you've broken the confounding relationship between the confounder Z and the treatment X. Uh, but the relationship between these two graphs, which I'll call the observational interventional one, is a coupling. That coupling you assume is that the function that produces the outcome is the same in the interventional setup or in the observational setup, assuming that I know all the confounders. But more specifically, causality is really providing a way to reason about what might be fixed. Like if we think about like the real world and we're like, hey, I'm gonna like shoot a projectile. The laws of like physics that tell me where that projectile will land will be fixed regardless of the amount of impulse I decide to provide. Okay. But all this added flexibility, you shouldn't be like, hey, the world is wonderful. Uh, I can solve everything now. I have all these new couplings. I'll just pick the one. I'll pick the notion of error and I'll just write an algorithm and get a good answer. Because with more flexibility, you're gonna get estimation cost. Um, for the invariant risk case, you, could, you should ask me how many environments do you need to figure out what is actually fixed. It could be a gigantic number. I may need like all the hospitals in the world. For average risk, you'd be like, do you need data from all the environments? If so, that kind of like throws away the problem because you'd like to be able to generalize to new ones. For distributions with nuisances, like uh, who here has seen like propensity scores for causal inference? I see some hands, but basically like if you divide by a really small number, this probability is very tiny. This is gonna be a very big value, and so you'll have a lot of variance. And that variance can make estimation very difficult. If we move to machine learning, we have like our, say, very flexible models in machine learning. It's possible to also minimize the loss on every single training point. Like your model is actually just interpolating. If I minimize the loss on every training point, if I take a weighted version of that loss to sort of upweight examples that are rare, you'll get the same minimizer. Like the minimizer of something for each individual data point is also going to be a minimizer of the weighted collection. And so this will lead to algorithmic problems when you have very flexible models. Further, like conditional independence, hard to estimate, hard to test, even harder to penalize in an objective because you need to track it as the optimization is moving. So I'm just gonna go back to a really high level now so you can just get some takeaways here. So out of distribution generalization requires a coupling, a relationship between training and test distributions. The coupling is similar to the assumption that you'll see traditionally that training is equal to test. Different couplings, how training and tests are related, lead to different algorithms. Multiple test distributions makes it hard to say what is good. One predictor could be good on one test distribution, but bad on another. A different predictor could switch that. Uh, limiting to a subclasses of predictors that have simultaneous optimality, like the invariant predictor or NERD makes this notion of good easier to choose, because you can basically just pick it for a single distribution. Estimation is a challenge. Like it's still hard. Like if you run these algorithms, you can get them to work, but there's some effort that will go into them, partly because of the issues we just saw. Uh, NERD is an algorithm that targets a simultaneous optim optimal predictor when you have these nuisance label relationships like background uh, with animal or hospital with pneumonia changing. And some final questions that I'll leave us with. One is like, you probably should really question what's going on in the beginning. 
because this problem of detecting cows versus penguins is actually deterministic in that if I have no occlusion and I look at an image, you can exactly tell me that there's a cow here, exactly tell me that there is a penguin here. When it's deterministic, you know that if you could take your training data and get as good as possible as, that, as long as the background isn't fully predictive, you would find an answer that would generalize, meaning that the perfect answer in your training data set will also be the perfect one in the test data set. So you should ask yourself, like, you know, why, why are we doing this? You know, like, do we actually have the right uh, hammer for this problem? Or is there something else going on for at least a subset of them where the label is not random? Even further, I didn't talk about generalizing out of support. Like if you have training data where cows are on grass and ice, and then I give you a cow on sand, that is out of support. You don't actually see that in your sampling distribution. You'd like to be able to do this, but by what basis could you do this? And then in practice, uh, this is a question that we got in the back, which is like, how do you close the gap uh, to a known achievable performance? Like if a person can do it, uh, an algorithm could do it with enough samples, but uh, what's the limitation? Where is, where is sort of the uh, bottleneck in achieving that performance? Um, and here are the references to the research bits that are at the beginning. The other references to sort of the more tutorialized version were spread throughout at the bottom. I'll take any other questions if we have any. Yeah, there's one in the back. Yeah, really nice talk. I, I, so I'm curious if you have like, anything to say if you don't know Z or if you, you don't know what your nuisances are. Is there any literature on that? Yeah. Well, if you don't know Z and you have data from a single distribution, you're in trouble because you don't know exactly how you're even coupling to the test. If you have data from multiple distributions, so say like you run an experiment in like one, on one day in like one batch, and then you run an experiment in a different one, those could be different environments and you'll be able to estimate at least what is changing across that setup. If so your friend gives you some data from like down the road, you'll get a little bit more invariance on top of it. So if you do collect more environments, you can get somewhere a little bit further. If you also have an idea of like what the label might be or what, uh, instead of thinking about what the nuisances might be, you can try to use some of these data augmentations that I showed with the pictures. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, yeah, it's like IRM or something related to it. Like running IRM uh, may be difficult, but there are versions that try to enforce invariant risk that would do it. Um, but for a lot of these problems, you have some idea, like the hospital problem, you have scanners that are related. For the uh, background problem, you can actually just do the segmentation without knowing what the label is for the animal classification. And a combination of the two, Nobody's really tried that, but highly worthwhile because uh, you may fix some of the estimation, like the number of environments problems in IRM. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, thanks. <laughs>